the second session of the 2024 Ohio State University Extension Beef Team's Virtual Beef School was hosted via Zoom on February 15th. This year's four evening beef school sessions are taking a deep dive into production practices and factors that impact quality and profitability when it comes to producing beef to be marketed directly to consumers. This second session focused on the challenges of feeding and finishing cattle to a specific time and finish. Listen in as OSU Extension Beef Field Specialist Garth Ruff discusses management considerations when feeding cattle with a specific endpoint in mind. My name is Garth Ruff, Beef Cattle Feed Field Specialist for OSU Extension. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the nutrition side of things here this evening. I think Al and Dean did a pretty good job last month talking about genetics. Um, you know, we'll reference some of the stuff they covered as it relates to beef quality and marbling development and such. But really going to focus on uh, nutrition, managing nutrition. We'll talk a little bit about feedstuffs based on some of the questions that I've received um, while in this position here at Ohio State. Uh, and just kind of work through this as it relates to getting these cattle finished kind of with an end point in mind, right? As we think about these local beef production goals, you know, certainly eating experience is number one as it relates to selling beef and having return customers. Uh, a lot of times we're concerned about the weight of these cattle uh, as we work with our local processors or carcass weight or quarter weight. However, we're selling that beef, if we're selling in bulk to the consumer, right? We know uh, economics these days, uh, inside of beef is expensive, right? So we want to be able to maximize uh, the dollar for the customer, but yet be able to sell product and maximize live production system as well. As we think about production systems, grain fed versus grass fed, uh, we could spend a whole lot of time talking about grass fed or some non maybe traditional markets uh, we'll touch on some of that briefly uh, but for the most part we're going to talk about kind of conventional type cattle feeding so we think about cost you know is the goal here to optimize or maximize um, i'll leave that up to you but at the end of the day hopefully we can be profitable as we feed these cattle uh, and go ahead and sell their end product to the consumer I think when we think about the challenges here, uh, it's different customer taste, whether that's the quantity of beef that they want to buy from retail cuts all the way up to whole carcasses. And kind of the big one and what we're going to spend a lot of time on is how do we manage cattle for a given period of time? What differing systems are out there? What differing feedstuffs are out there? Because uh, a lot of times these harvest dates are booked well in advance. So we'll work through a kind of a couple different scenarios, uh, you know, and talking with Stan there earlier today, question was, well, what if we've got to hold one? We'll touch on that a little bit too. That gets a little bit complicated, uh, but that question does pop up from time to time. So we're going to kind of start out talking about energy and marbling, right? As we think about eating experience, a big driver that is marbling, um, you know, whether we have these cattle graded or not, marbling is that intramuscular fat that kind of white fat within the muscle. Um, but in order to understand how marbling gets into the muscle, certainly there's a genetic component. We're not going to cover a whole lot of that today. Al and Dean did a pretty good job. But from a nutrient standpoint, we need to understand how nutrients are used. And there's kind of this hierarchy as we think about every bite that animal eats, where those nutrients are partitioned to. First, the animal's got to maintain itself, right? If we got growing animals, which we do in this case, they got to develop, grow, right? We think about brood cows, lactation falls in there, and then reproduction, and then certainly fattening is at the end, right? Think about if you've got some brood cows at home uh, and we get into a drought year or poor quality feed, what's the first thing that happens, right? They get thin, they give up fat first. Uh, so fattening and especially marbling as one of the different deposit areas of fat tends to be some of the last um, segregation of nutrients, right? To look at this in a little bit different way, 
think about what that animal needs to do to stay alive. All right, we got to support the nervous system first. We got to have us develop a skeleton, connective tissue. All right, we'll talk a little bit about skeletal growth. Our, the organs got to grow and develop. And then we're going to put energy in the muscle. And then once again, fat at the various deposits. So uh, we feed carbohydrates to ruminants, whether that's starch from grain or cellulose, hemicellulose from fiber-based carbohydrates, which typically come from forages. Um, and that's the cool thing about the rumen, right? The rumen and animal allows us to utilize forages. Starch and cellulose are both these carbohydrates derived from the same molecule, glucose, sugar, right? But the big difference is how they're put together. And I'm not going to even attempt to draw that anymore. Um, but the big difference is this beta linkage that we have in plant carbohydrates, um, which provide fiber. But the bacteria allow us to utilize the energy in those plants. And we also can utilize some energy from things such as uh, soybean hulls as a source of fiber and a little bit of energy. All right. Think about what that looks like uh, conceptually from a plant. Right, so starch is kind of a non-fiber carbohydrate. Just about any farm animal can digest starch from corn or grain products, um, but we're going to utilize those rumen bacteria uh, to break down those cellulose products, which we typically find in the fiber portion of the plant. So a high concentrate, grain-based, or starchy type of diet, we're going to create propionate. All right. And a lot of times we think about feeding the animal. But if I learn anything from ruminant nutrition at Ohio State is, yes, we're feeding the animal. But we're, what we're really doing is feeding the microbes in that room. Uh, those microbes are going to break down carbohydrates, starches, cellulose into different products. Uh, and the main product as it relates to energy are these volatile fatty acids. So propionate is one of these volatile fatty acids, as well as acetate. Uh, there's a third one, butyrate. We're not going to spend much time talking about butyrate. It's kind of the uh, third, third wheel here, if you will. Um, but these starchy diets, grain-based diets, are going to increase propionate production relative to acetate. Propionate is going to go be converted back into the glucose in the liver. And the more glucose we have in that liver, we're going to improve average daily gain, tissue growth per day, and marbling deposition. So in a, the most simple drawing that I could find of this is we put feed into the rumen. The microbes ferment the feed. We get propionate. We get acetate and butyrate. We're also going to produce some methane. That's going to exit, once again, back out through the cow, through the animal. And then we're going to move that fermented feed, that fermented product on through the animal, um, through the digestive system. And we're gonna use energy uh, for that animal to do things such as maintain itself, move, um, et cetera. When we think about those VFAs or those volatile fatty acids, acetate's certainly important when we think about dairy cattle or we think about brood cows, right? It's gonna contribute to milk fat. Um, beef system, we need milk fat uh, to provide energy to newborn calves. In a fed cattle system, we're more concerned about propionate, which once again is going to end up as glucose in the liver. Uh, this is some older uh, research here, but basically what this slide shows, as we increase forage in the diet, we increase acetate relative to propionate, and as we increase concentrate or grain in the diet, we do just the opposite, right? Acetate's still the predominant VFA, but the more propionate we can produce, once again, better average daily gain, better lean tissue accretion, and better marbling development. How can we increase propionate production in the rumen? There's several ways. We can increase passage rate by processing feed, to reduce particle size, we'll talk about what that ideal size is here in a little bit. We can increase the rate of fermentation by feeding more grain or starch, right? Uh, 
certainly by doing that, we're going to decrease the pH. That helps as well. Um, and here in the U.S., we have some technology available to us, such as rumensin or Bovatec, uh, which select against the bacteria that are in the rumen uh, that produce acetate. So we kill off some acetate producing uh, bacteria, and that's going to improve the ratio of propionate to acetate. Think about how fat cells grow, right? Marbling is intramuscular fat, they're fat cells. Uh, so propionate is going to provide 50 to 70% of the units needed uh, for marbling development. And we're only going to get 1 to 10% of those for acetate, right? Or excuse me, uh, propionate is going to provide 50 to 70% of the units for intramuscular or marbling development and only 1 to 10% for subcutaneous or back fat development, right? And then the rest of the uh, acetyl units are going to be back absorbed through the animal and converted as energy. So it's a combination of things. It's genetics, it's days on high energy diet and propionate fermentation, which is going to determine marbling. Um, you know, a question I get once in a while is, you know, does age have an impact? Uh, not really, right? It's more of how that animal has been managed, the genetic potential of that ant animal uh, versus its age as it relates to marbling deposition. All right, so as we think about this conversation, nutrition versus genetics, and we get into nutrition management here in a couple of slides, right, I think marbling development is a prime example of using nutrition to either maximize or optimize genetic potential. All right, kind of pun intended there. Um, so we have to have the genetics with the potential to marble. If, we're, if that's the market we're chasing, which in most cases we are, right? As we think about eating experience being the number one driver in this thing. But then on the flip side, we have to have a diet, provide a diet that allows genetic potential to express itself. Right. So it's not one without the other, um, but it's a combination of the two working together in order to produce quality beef and a positive eating experience. We think about animal performance and growth. Right. Certainly there's this conversation as we think about locally produced or direct to consumer beef of carcass weight versus quality. Because, you know, whether it's due to cost, freezer space, what have you, uh, number of people in the household, a lot of times our customers don't necessarily want a whole beef carcass. Maybe they only want a 350 pound half or 300 pound half for that matter. All right. So that's easy enough to provide. But we got to do some math to plan ahead as we think about animal growth and development. With today's genetics, can we get marbling or quality into lighter weight cattle? You know, at one time this was pretty, pretty straightforward. But as we've made cattle larger over the years, it's something to think about. But the answer is still yes, if we have proper nutrition, which is days on feed in a lot of cases and providing high energy um, during the finishing phase. I'm gonna encourage everybody to work with a nutritionist. Um, you know, we have several feed companies, several uh, feed mills across the state of Ohio here. Uh, work with a nutritionist to balance a diet. You know, certainly if need be, uh, I can help troubleshoot some things. Uh, we've got some folks on campus that can help troubleshoot some things, but work with a nutritionist to develop a diet that suits your production system, right? Yeah, there might be a little bit of cost, but I, I think you'll find that it'll pay for itself relatively quickly uh, in terms of cattle performance and quality. All right, so here's uh, one scenario. Uh, it's, you know, we're looking at February 15th today. I've got a harvest date booked at the processor for June 15th. Right. My customer wanted those 350 pound halves. We think back to that. So 700 pound carcass. I just ballparked a number at 62% dressing and come up with an 1130 pound live animal. The steer uh, that I've got entering the feedlot today weighs 650 pounds. 1130 minus 650, 480 pounds of gain. I've got 120 days on feed to accomplish that gain. 
I need 480 pounds, 120 days. My target average daily gain is four pounds a day. Can we do it? The answer is yes, but we're probably not going to consider backgrounding as an option here. And we're going to have a pretty short growing phase, right? That growing phase might only be that acclimation period as we get this to your uh, adjusted to high energy diet. Different scenario, which is not uncommon, right? I've got a harvest date scheduled for September 15th. Same deal, 700 pound carcass, 62% dress. Still looking for that 1130 pound steer. He weighs 650 today, but now I've got 210 days on feed. 480 pounds spread over 210 days, looking just over two and a quarter pounds a gain per day. Right. Hopefully any calf with much genetic merit at all um, can pull that off, right? Providing they stay healthy. So we have more options. We might consider a stalkering or backgrounder phase. Uh, maybe a longer growing period. Um, you know, we don't do very good here at, in Ohio at times about differentiating what these different terms mean. You know, parts of the country, stockering is almost exclusively on pasture and grazing forage. You know, a backgrounding lot might utilize corn silage or harvested annuals, grower phase, um, you know, somewhere in between, right? Um, we've done a lot of research, continuing to do research here at Ohio State, looking at, you know, what is the optimal length of these different phases, whether it's backgrounding or a growing phase of these cattle enter the feedlot before it being put on a high energy diet. So there's very two different approaches to feeding those two different steers based on when my harvest date with the local processor is. All right, so as we think about stockering or backgrounding, once again, you'll probably hear me use these interchangeably, but one form or another, we're gonna think about utilizing forages. And forage is gonna provide us a relatively low cost of gain, whether that's a cattle out on grass, or they're grazing, harvesting that forage themselves, or if I'm feeding corn silage, right, the advantage there, or sorghum Sudan grass, any sort of ensiled product, the advantage there is tons per acre. Our goal here is to grow frame, and to have lean gain. I don't want my stalker backgrounder calves entering the feedlot with much condition in terms of fat. We want to be able to capitalize on that transition from this system to the finishing phase with compensatory gain. I think that's on a coming slide. Um, but as we ramp the energy up to these cattle through the diet, they're going to become more efficient because we've already grown the frame We've already de developed some organs and different things. These type of systems, if we were going to sell these calves, would produce what we consider these yearling type cattle. Um, you know, just be aware that not every calf suits a stockering or backgrounding phase. Certainly, if I got to get four pounds a day out of this steer, that's one reason the calf doesn't suit this system. But another reason would be if I wean a highly productive calf from a highly productive cow. Do I want to slow that animal down, right? Am I going to gain much from a forage-based system, or does that animal need to enter the feedlot directly post-weaning? Right? Not every average, not all average daily gains the same. We know when we put these cattle in a high forage situation, we're going to make the organs bigger. We're going to make that rumen bigger, right? We're going to feed more fiber, more mass, that rumen, that digestive system is going to stretch out as the forage content in the diet increases. The larger the organs are, we're going to impact feed efficiency uh, and reduce dressing percentage. Right. I like to think of a growing phase as starting that animal onto a concentrate and then stepping that animal on up until we get to the finishing phase where we're kind of at that final diet, right? So we're gonna have some forage in that growing diet. And then we're gonna ramp up the concentrate, ramp up the energy. Um, the finishing phase, right? That's our high energy feed. This is gonna be a pretty energy dense diet. 
We're going to think about protein sources and really think about feedstuffs that complement each other as we think about mixing them in a complete diet. Once again, the growing phase, we're going to emphasize a little bit of lean gain. We're really going to focus in on fattening and finishing. We're really going to capitalize on compensatory gain from those cattle that have come out of that stocker or backgrounded uh, a lot if we move from forage to high energy. Because once again, we've already invested into the skeleton. We've invested into some lean gain. Uh, so our early pounds, um, early weight added to those cattle in the finishing phase, they're pretty efficient. Right, so as we enter that growing or finishing phase, keep in mind as body weight increases, we need to feed the cattle more, right? Because they're gonna have increased requirements for dry matter, crude protein, calcium and phosphorus, right? Kind of the two minerals we think about for finishing cattle. Um, you know, in this example, an animal that's gaining 3.99 or awful close to our four pounds a day, um, course, finished at 1,300 pounds, uh, is going to be eating a diet somewhere around 61 mega cows net energy a gain, right? We'll talk about what that means here in a little bit. So as we look at nutrient requirements, certainly in the grower phase, we have less energy in that diet, more forage. So think about energy, you know, when we talk about it in a cow-calf setting, awful, oftentimes is total digestible nutrients. Right. In a feedlot type setting, we talk about net energy of gain. After I feed a diet, what's left to contribute to gain of that animal? Right. Um, you know, so in a grower diet, that's lower energy. We might have an NEG of 56. In a finisher diet, 62, 63, 64, somewhere in that range is awful common. And you can see here what happens to uh, protein, right, as the animal gets larger, the percentage of protein actually goes down, but we're feeding more pounds of it. So think about that growing phase as we in it, put that calf into the feedlot. Maybe they've been weaned for 45, 60 days. Maybe they're coming off that stalker forage ration. We're still going to start with some forage, right? We're going to begin with some grass hay or mixed hay, uh, you know, especially with cattle that have never eaten out of a feed bunk before. Um, you know, a lot of times some grass hay is uh, an attractant, right? They know how to eat hay in a lot of instances. So we're going to start with some grass hay and we're going to begin to introduce uh, some energy, whether that's silage, grain, supplement, but we're still going to keep feeding some hay. Um, as they continue to consume that hay leach grain or supplement, we're going to reduce the dry hay fed typically. And we're going to continue this grower diet until the appetite of the cattle in the lot can be managed with good feed bunk management. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Right. We don't want to rush cattle in this phase. We don't want to increase the energy too quickly. Um, cause things like acidosis, right? And we'll talk about why that's a bad thing. We want to keep that rumen as happy as possible, get these cattle used to eating out of a bunk, right? Especially if they're balling calves in, a, in an instance, uh, get them acclimated to eating out of a bunk, uh, get them up to two, two and a half percent of intake before we start fiddling with the formulation of forage versus concentrate. Right, especially we have balling calves. Right? We got to teach those cattle to eat out of a bunk. Uh, silage is pretty appealing uh, because of the aroma. Grass hay, we can use things like molasses to get those cattle started to eat. Um, you know, if we have challenges with coccidiosis early on, um, when these animals start to eat uh, some concentrate feed that hadn't previously, you can see the products there that the we, we can use to, get, to control some of that. So when do we end this growing phase? Well, it's going to depend on frame size and body condition of the cattle, right? If I've got a 
my 1130 pound steers in the same pen as a steer that needs to weigh 1400 pounds when he's finished, they're going to end that growing phase at different times. All right. But we need to think about energy density of the diet and when the cattle are going to be finished. And we'll, I'll show you some pictures of cattle at two different finish points. Uh, but oftentimes, especially if you've got cows at home, kind of a ballpark indicator would be think about a cow that's a body condition score of seven. Um, you know, that might be a good way to think about when these cattle are finished in terms of fat cover. All right. So if we're aiming for a 1200 pound slaughter weight um, at that BCS so seven kind of picture, and if I've got a large frame steer, on a high energy diet, I'm going to probably end that growing phase somewhere between 700 and 800 pounds. And I don't want to wait too long because if I wait too long, I'm going to continue to grow that skeleton, grow that framework, and ultimately need to feed that calf longer to get it to the same end point. So as we look at this net energy or the energy left for gain from a given diet, um, you know, we look at different feedstuffs depending on uh, the system that you're set up with. But if I've got corn silage versus corn, this is high moisture corn in this, this instance. Um, you know, just be aware that as we increase corn grain and decrease the amount of corn silage, our net energy of gain goes up. As we increase the forage and decrease the concentrate, our net energy of gain goes down. Kind of a similar story as we think about that propionate to acetate ratio from earlier. All right. So now we're in the finishing phase. Some of our goals is I want to maintain health, you know, certainly respiratory health, foot health, those type of things, but gut health. I want to maintain that animal's growth rate. I want to minimize feed to gain, right? the amount of feed it takes to get a pound of gain. We often call that feed efficiency. And I want to attain carcass, carcass composition as desired by the market, desired by our customer, right? If you've heard me talk about fed cattle evaluation or some, something along those lines before, you know, I typically maintain we need to sell cattle when they're finished. So if that dictates a smaller calf or a calf that weighs 130 pounds or 1130 pounds right we need to have cattle that we know genetically can finish at that weight we'll talk about finish here in a little bit we want to avoid getting cattle too fat you know i think dale will tell you here in april uh they can get too fat right so not only does that fat cost a lot of money to put on in the feedlot it's going to cost the processor quite a bit of money to trim that fat away uh, and ultimately put it in a barrel somewhere. When we think about that step up, switching from forage to grain, it needs to be gradual. You know, two weeks to a month, right? And you stepping the percentage of concentrate, we might start at 30, then 50, 60, and on up, you know, to 80, 85% of the diet, right? We really want to avoid things like rumensin. Um, if we're putting calves directly into this finishing phase, think of that calf, it's got to gain four pounds a day. Let's get him stepped up to full feed um, before we put in a full dose of rumensin. It's kind of sour and astringent tasting, uh, not super palatable as we try to ramp these calves up to full feed. So here's what a feed intake record might look like depending on the days on feed, um, that calf might start out eating 10 pounds and by day nine to 17 pounds. And by day 21, we're pretty much on full feed somewhere 20, 22 pounds. Uh, if we look at the pink line there, those cattle, I'm gonna guess the target rate was 25 pounds per day. So it's a gradual in increase in feed intake. All right, that's what we want to see, gradual, leveling off until that animal's harvested. So when do we want to market these cattle or what, when are they finished, right? So a lot of times we show this 
pretty typical growth curve where we get growth over time. I really want to market that animal or harvest that animal at the time where muscle accretions really starts to plateau or slow down as a percentage and fats starting to pick up, right? By this point, our skeleton's pretty well developed. So harvest cattle, self-fed cattle when they are finished. So how do we evaluate finish? All right. So we're going to look at different indicators on the animal. Think about what those buyers are doing at the auction yard in a period of 30 seconds to a minute. Right. They're looking at finish. They're looking at muscle compared to fat. But certainly as it relates to cattle quality and marbling, trying to get an idea if there's enough back fat, subcutaneous fat there, um, because those two are highly correlated, right? So we're looking for cattle that are smooth over the shoulder. We're going to look in that tail head. Uh, if it's steer, we have some cod fat. We're going to look at that brisket, right? In this instance, the black steer weighed 950 pounds. It was a yield grade four choice plus. Uh, we can see the Charlet base steer. Pretty trim, uh, brisket's pretty empty, kind of a tight belly line there. Uh, we can see some indent behind the shoulder, kind of in that heart girth area, maybe some patchy fat. Um, here's, a, here's a steer that weighed 1250, only had 0.2 inches of back fat. From a yield grade standpoint, did very well. He's probably a heavy muscle calf as well, but not enough there in terms of quality grade. Part of, part of it due to nutrition, the other part due to genetics. So what if cattle grow too fast? Not something we often think about in commercial beef production setting. But if I've got a harvest date that's weeks out or months out, or think about the junior fair kid, uh, our county fair is Labor Day week. Think about the junior fair kid with the Labor Day fair, and that steer weighs 1,300 pounds in July, or, or 1,350 in July. What do you do, right? <laughs> uh, I, I was reading one article that kind of talked about holding hope. I'm not sure that's the best strategy, but in the end of the day, in order to maintain quality, we still have to provide enough energy in that diet for that animal to still grow. Right, because if we think about that hierarchy and nutrient use, tying this back to the very first or second slide, right, fattening was on the tail end of that, and marbling is on the tail end of fattening. Right, so if I really cut the energy or eliminate energy in the diet and go to more of a forage-based diet right away, first thing I'm going to do is marbling, then it's going to be back fat, then seam fat, and then on down. Right. So we still want that animal to grow, but we're going to slow that growth rate, right? That steer that was gaining four pounds a day, so he might have to dial him down to two and a half in order to maintain that marbling. And what we're going to do is essentially stretch out that growth curve, right? We can either limit feed or reduce, not eliminate the amount of energy in that feed in order to maintain both finish and the marbling that's already been deposited. Talk about feed bunk management or feed management. Our end goal is to keep the rumen happy. There's a picture of a really healthy rumen where we got those little fingers that papillae. Uh, they're nice and long. The more surface area we have in the rumen, the better absorption of nutrients we have. How do we know if the rumen's not happy, right? Think about what that manure cake looks like. What should it look like, right? If our, we got animals that are have challenges with gut health, and ac acidosis, you know, we might have a one or a two of these puddles, if you will. Um, you know, feedlot cattle, a lot of times we get a three. Um, it spreads a little bit, but still makes kind of a patty. That's pretty good. The stiffer those feces get, uh, maybe we've got too much fiber in the diet. So what is acidosis, right? Long and short, it's when the pH of the rumen drops because we've got too much for minimal energy. This can happen if we switch from whole corn to ground corn, make an immediate switch from pasture to corn silage. 
cattle go off feed, uh, some different things, kind of a symptom of acidosis over time. Right? If we have foundered cattle or we get excess hoof growth, uh, those are cattle that oftentimes um, have experienced some acidosis. Right? So we got cattle that are doing well, they get ac acidotic in an acute way, which is really bad over a short period of time, pH drop. Uh, we're going to reduce feed intake. We're going to see that diarrhea. Um, if this continues for a period of time, potentially that founder. If we have chronic or slight acidosis, we might not see symptoms. We might not see that loose manure. Uh, but feed intake is going to be sporadic, and they might not gain as efficient. Right? We can use good feed bunk management to minimize the impacts or the risk of acidosis. So our goals here, we want animals to eat a consistent amount of feed. We want to maximize or optimize performance and minimize digestive challenges. So if I feed cattle in the morning, what should this feed bunk look like in the evening if fed twice daily? What should that bunk look like? Probably somewhere in between those two pictures is ideal. I don't really want a slick bunk because oftentimes that tells me I'm not feeding the cattle enough. But if I've got feed piled in that bunk, it probably tells me I'm feeding them too much or they're off feed. Right. So anytime we utilize bunk management, kind of crumbs um, are what we're shooting for. So as we think about bunk feeding cattle, uh, it needs to be routine, consistent amount, consistent time with consistent ingredients. All right. So as we kind of step them up through that system from growing to finishing, I want a consistent amount for a period of days and go on to that next step. If I'm only feeding once, all right, should only be crumbs remaining. That argument for feeding twice a day, I would want crumbs remaining uh, between feedings. If we're going to make changes, we need to make them slowly, slow and small. Right? We don't want to necessarily limit intake. We want to satisfy that animal's appetite or that group of animals' appetite without overfeeding them. Right? Because as we have steady intake, we're going to have steady growth. So what does this look like in the room? What is ideal? Right? So if I feed these cattle twice a day, say at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., as, as it shows in this example, those animals are going to get up and they're going to eat at 8 a.m. They're going to slow down feed intake and we're going to feed them again. We're going to get a spike and we're going to slow down. And what that does to that rumen pH or that red line is it keeps it, yes, there's humping valleys, but it's relatively steady. And that's the ultimate goal, to keep that rumen pH as steady as possible as we feed feed these cattle, All right? What happens if I have irregular or erratic feed intake, All right? For whatever reason, say that animal eats at eight o'clock and stops. And then at 8 p.m., eat the pile of feed and continues eating in this particular instance, All right? We wanna avoid those roller coasters and room and pH. So oftentimes we think about if we're feeding a bunk, it's a TMR type diet, or if we're hand feeding, right? We have a concentrate diet that's mixed relatively evenly. Uh, and that's the goal, to deliver bites of feed at the same time where every bite's uniform. As you can see with the pictures of the Holsteins, that feed's provided there for a period of time. Whether they're feeding once a day or twice a day, but the feed's uniform. And by providing an, the right amount of feed, we can optimize feed intake and ruin pH. And then other picture, and I didn't have a great one of the system we have in place at the research feedlot, um, but we have a grow safe system. What that system allows us to do is track feed intake, right? We put so much feed in it. There's a uh, RFID reader panel that reads that animal once it sticks its head into the feeder and a scale in that bunk that measures disappearance as that animal eats, right? So in a research setting, that's pretty good information to have 
when we think about intake of animals within a pen, but individual animals as well. In a bunk scoring system, um, this was made uh, pretty popular out in South Dakota, kind of this four point system, right? A zero is no feed remaining in the bunk. In that instance, probably need to feed more. Kind of that goal of crumbs is kind of that half. Uh, scattered feed present, most of the bunks exposed. A ones, kind of a uniform layer, one kernel deep. And you can see twos, threes, and fours. In that instance, we're either feeding too much feed or the animals aren't eating it for whatever reason. Whether they're acidotic, it's not palatable, whatever the instance might be. All right. So we're kind of shooting for that half. We want some crumbs. Um, that tells us we're providing enough feed, uh, but those animals aren't hungry when we go back to feed. That's kind of the ultimate goal. See a couple questions popping in here. Takes a second. Uh, one of the questions was, does the weight of the dam correlate to the finished weight of her offspring? Uh, you know, eh, this is an interesting question. Uh, had that conversation yeah, actually real recently, right? So as we think about the weight of the dam, or in this instance, I'll even use another example, the live birth weight of a bull, right? Think about weight. And what impacts weight? Part of that's genetics, and the other part's nutrition, right? We know with genetics that the actual birth weight of that bull calf is not near as important or near as accurate as the EPD for birth weight and calving ease. So yes, it does correlate, but I would look at EPDs for mature weight, mature height, uh, carcass weight, um, as probably a better indicator because we're going to take the environment or nutrition out of that equation. Uh, we'll tackle the other one here in a little bit. We wind down. Steer stuffers, self feeders. Um, you know, over the years, uh, we've heard nutritionists, you know, kind of be pretty tough on these things. Uh, but they do have some advantages, and the advantages are low labor uh, for producers that have off-the-farm employment, right? Limited time to feed cattle, uh, takes minimal bunks or feeding equipment, right? Bunk space uh, in a daily fed system or TMR system is always a limiting factor to how many animals we can put in that pen. It's usually not square feet. It's bunk space. That's our limiting factor. Our disadvantages here, right? We're limited to dry feeds. Uh, do not mistake a creep feeder for a 200 pound calf as the same feeder uh, for fed cow, right? They just simply don't hold enough feed and there's not enough space there um, in, in terms of bunk space uh, for them, for the pen space that you have. And we have no idea to know if those cattle are eating or not, right? Because we're not watching them come to the bunk once or twice a day. So if we have cattle that go off feed in these systems, more likely to have acidosis. And when those cattle decide they want to eat, we have acute acidosis. And this is where we see increased death loss uh, on a self feeder versus a bunk fed system where we're feeding cattle daily. And the cattle are also less efficient, right? We know that from numerous studies, they're going to eat more feed, um, you know, because it's not prescribed to them, right? If I have an out of feed event with a self feeder, do not refill that thing. We have got to start over and ramp those cattle up slowly to get back to full feed. Um, you know, we talk about digestive upset. That would be like fasting for 30 days and going to the Golden Corral or someplace like that. Um, this is where we see some big challenges. We do have to manage these things. Um, they're not uh, a silver bullet. Talk a little bit about bunk management. Uh, we're going to finish up talking about feedstuffs. 
Um, and I, you know, and I always like to leave this thought that feeding cattle cheap isn't always cost effective. Um, just because we can buy cheap feed doesn't mean it's good feed, right? And we'll go back and think about some of the goals in producing direct to consumer or local beef. We want quality, right? And off, we're looking to optimize a system in terms of cost. Probably not looking to maximize. So if I've got a customer that's willing to pay for a product, a quality product, we might as well put the right fuel into that animal. Right. Feeding cattle, feeding animals cheap in general isn't always the most cost effective. So as we think about our grain, starch or energy sources, however you want to look at it, as we look at them based on the digestion rate, certainly our small grains do digest faster um, compared to corn. Right. It's not always a good thing. We'll talk a little bit about if you are going to feed small grains, there are some things we have to take into consideration. The nice thing about corn as a primary energy source is we've got a whole lot of options. You know, whether we process that corn, whether we feed it whole, we roll it, we crack it. High moisture corn is a great product, a little bit harder to handle. We do have options with corn as an energy source. And if we look at the comparison of energy across the different feedstuffs, yeah, certainly some um digest faster but as we look at energy per unit you know uh, corn more often than not is going to be our cost effective energy source right so if we look at that NEG or that net energy of gain that we find in dry corn now i've got a bushel of corn that weighs 56 pounds at 15 percent moisture right so that means i get 85 percent dry matter so in a bushel of corn, I'm going to get 47.6% dry matter at 0.68 megacals of net energy of gain. Divide that by our dry matter, end up with 32.37 megacals of energy of gain. Corn today was roughly $4.20 a bushel. $4.20 divided the megacals in that bushel of corn, right? Pretty cheap, 13 cents per megacal of energy. We think about things such as oats, barley, wheat, um, even though they digest faster than the price, they're typically higher priced than corn. So I said we have options as it relates to corn. And most of the time we're talking about dry corn, right? But do we need to process it? Get to that here in a second. But if we do process it, we got to consider the fiber in the diet, the percentage of fiber. If I have whole shell corn, the corn that's cracked, maybe into three pieces per kernel, I've got more options, right? I don't have to have necessarily a high fiber diet for that animal to utilize this coarser cracked corn or whole corn, right? We know that cattle will chew whole corn. And actually by chewing, chewing this corn, we're gonna get buffering factor uh, from the saliva to help with room and pH. If I crack that corn into five to seven pieces, uh, we need more fiber in the diet. If I've got corn that looks like this, it's way too fine, right? If I see corn like this in a steer stuffer, this is where I start looking for slow gaining cattle, cattle that are foundered, and yellow watering manure. Right? And these are some pictures as it relates to hog feed, but all this corn was ground at the same setting. Right? So we need to consider corn moisture. Was that corn dried in storage? And was it dried properly? Um, so we do need to sample corn, or if you're buying from a mill, hopefully they're sampling some corn as it comes comes into them. We think about corn processing. Dr. Relling did a study, uh, and the results of this study, the whole thing's available online. If you just search OSU eBarns 2022, where they looked at whole shell corn versus cracking the corn, we can see we had 
Uh, the whole shell corn group, 48% choice, 52 and cracked corn. Whole shell corn, 25% prime, 18% cracked. Uh, no difference in carcass weight. Dressing percentage varied a little bit. Um, really no difference in ribeye area. So we looked at the performance of those animals. Uh, certainly cattle um, that were on whole shell corn, why there were really no differences until we got into feed efficiency. Body weight, average daily gain, dry matter intake were not significant. We did see significant differences um, in feed efficiency. In this, this particular study, the cattle fed whole shell corn were more efficient um, and did have a higher percent of intramuscular fat, um, which would have led to the differences in quality grade. What about corn silage? You know, the, if made properly, it's a great feed. And it's going to be cost effective due to the yield per acre. We're going to get some fiber. Once again, it's got to be made properly. You know, typically we're going to look at some supplemental energy in the finishing phase. Uh, adding some dry corn to a silage-based TMR. The big downfalls here is it requires machinery, right? That TMR mixer uh, from that picture with the Holsteins, that's not the cheapest piece of equipment in the world, and it's being pulled by a 125, 150-horse tractor. So it really depends on how many cattle you're going to feed and the methods you have to deliver feed in terms of bunks, uh, bins, et cetera, whether or not corn silage is going to be an option. Say so corn is nice because we have options. Um, here's uh, from the nutritional market requirements of beef cattle. Looking at a comparison between dry rural corn, high moisture corn, ear corn. I have several small cattle feeders in eastern and southern Ohio still feed some ear corn. Earlage, snapling, corn silage. A uh, big thing here to consider is storage. How are we going to store these different corn products and grinder setting if we're going to grind this product ourselves? Something to take into consideration. Feeding small grains. Um, you know, at times there might be some bargains on things such as wheat uh, here in Ohio, um, maybe barley, depending on where you're at, right? Uh, if we're going to feed small grains, it needs to be at relatively low levels of the diet. Um, then we can increase that amount over time. Most of these small grains do need processed. Uh, we don't want them to pass through that reticulum hole. Um, you know, the energy in them is highly digestible. Um, but we kind of, you know, we got to crack that product or grind that product um, in order to make that happen. Right. We can set an eye on four. Uh, to reduce overconsumption and acidosis, right? Because it's highly fermentable, we want to limit the amount of it uh, that's provided. Um, wouldn't recommend to feed small grains. I know the slide says we eat but small grains in general um, in a self-feeder, right? If we can't control intake, uh, it's probably not our best option. Uh, this is a little fuzzy. Uh, at least it is on my screen, but it looks at fiber sources, uh, especially, and I put this on here as we consider a primarily concentrate diet. Uh, and I like to highlight the fiber that's provided by soybean hulls, um, you know, 66% NDF, you know, awful similar to grass hay. I think if you go price of these out by the ton uh, and looking at maybe some of the available energy, um, and this is out of a dairy publication. But as we look at the available energy um, left in soybean hulls uh, compared to grass hay, oftentimes pretty economical soy sorts of fiber in a high concentrate diet. And they can come either as loose hulls or soy hull pellets. Cheap fiber. Look at, typically we're talking about the hay or the baleage that looks like what we can find in this picture um, that I took a couple summers ago, All right? Just because fiber or hay is cheap doesn't mean it's palatable, doesn't mean it's easy to handle, and we're going to lose the quality 
or the amount of that fiber due to dry matter losses. You know, those round bales in that picture might be 40% water at this stage. Um, you know, we've got spoilage, we've got waste, we've got contamination at the bottom of those bales. Um, you know, if we're looking at winter, summer annuals for fiber, whether that be wheat, cereal rye, triticale, or, you know, sorghum stand grass as a summer annual. Um, yeah, we can use that as a fiber and energy source. The big caution there is plant maturity. Um, if we let that plant get ahead of us um, in the far end of the boot stage, or if we're starting to see seed heads, um, we've already lost some digestibility and nutrients of those products. All right, we could spend a whole hour, hour and a half talking about grass-fed beef production, and you know, I've got that on the list for um, another another day and time. But as we think about you know, the nutrition of feeding grass-fed beef, I think genetics become even more important here. Right, we need to match the genetics of those animals to that production system. Right, think about increased lean gain. Um, you know, average daily gain is not going to be um, as high as we see in a conventional feedlot. Uh, it's takes going to take a little bit of time uh, because of the um, lesser concentration of energy to get to the same endpoint in terms of marbling and condition. So we really need to match cattle genetics to that production system. Um, you know, another thing to keep in mind is we have high vitamin A and fresh forages. Um, we do see an impact on marbling deposition. And uh, Stan Smith could tell you better than anybody. Um, you need to have a market for this product first, right? Uh, and, and maybe we'll have some folks touch on that in April. Um, just because we can produce something doesn't mean we can sell it, right? So we got to be sure that that market's in place. And once that market's in place, um, go ahead and feed the cattle. Any questions? See a couple here in the question and answer box. Does feed efficiency tend to vary between heifers and steers? <coughs> um, and in my experience, heifers tend to finish at lighter weights and steers are similar frame size. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's not only feed efficiency, uh, but it's also composition of that animal. Right? The heifer is going to tend to finish at lighter weights um, and often because they're lighter muscled and deposit fat. At, at a higher rate than steers with a similar frame size. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's some of the larger operators, you might even consider feeding steers and heifers separate. Or, you know, think about the instance of uh, some of our growers in Western Ohio, um, you know, feeding Holsteins, right? Or these crossbred cattle. Uh, they're certainly going to feed steers and heifers um, separate due to the composition of those animals. Another question, after switching a ration, how many days do I have to wait to see if average daily gain is increasing or decreasing? And I didn't put this, I've got an image that uh, I often use a lot to to kind of demonstrate this. You know, but if I weigh a calf today and I weigh a calf two weeks from now and I plot that on a chart, right, it's going to be a straight line, kind of a linear growth line because I've just got pounds over days. Um, but in reality, what's happening is there's waves within that line. Um, you know, I wouldn't, if you've got a set of scales, you know, and, and that's really what you need to know to know if average daily gain is increasing or decreasing. Uh, but give that animal three to five days to get adjusted to a diet, right? If it's just stepping up in terms of percent body weight, um, stepping up the rate of consumption. If you're changing that diet completely, um, you might wait three weeks, two, three weeks. Um, 
before that animal gets acclimated. 